I know this thing tends to make a horrible noise. Or indeed, we don't really make a noise at all. I know we can speak now, but we can speak softly. Um, I, uh, I was um, delighted, of course, to be invited to speak here. Uh, and, um, but also very curious as to what I was being asked to do. Uh, for the last few years, my work has really not been about the city at all, so I've uh, been kind of doing other kinds of things. Uh, specifically thinking about Freud, who I know uh, you lot don't think about. Uh, and some people I, in this room I know never think about Freud. So I've been thinking about Freud. But I was delighted to get the invitation. I said, what on earth do you want me to talk about? And they said, the city as a text. And I thought, ah, well that's a bit of a problem, because I don't really think about the city as a text. I neither think about, I don't think the city is a text, and I don't really use texts to think about the city. So, I thought, what can I possibly do that might be in any way vaguely relevant? Um, I actually tend to think about films a bit, and I think about Freud, so I'm going to blend Freud and a film and try and think about city space as a consequence. I'm sure you're now wondering why I've been invited at all, <laughs> if I don't do anything that is apparently relevant. I think I've been invited because uh, I do like to think about cities. I am a geographer, which means I like to think about cities and space. Uh, I have also, I think, uh, for a long time, been trying to map the relationship between cities and space and emotions and affect. So I've been looking for different ways in which I could try and map out or think about the relationship between uh, the psychology, emotions, city space, and what the relationship between all these things are. In the past, I've been, uh, and thanks to Olga for her brilliant theoretical and conceptual stuff at the beginning of her paper, because I've been drawing on some of those ideas, and specifically notions like phantasmagoria. And uh, in my uh, use, try to use that to think about city space. Uh, specifically, uh, drawing on the more phantom side of phantom phantasmagoria. So uh, I've actually uh, looked at the ways in which ghosts, vampires, dreams, uh, the occult and magic, voodoo, things like that appear in city life. So I've been trying to think about the ways in which cities, uh, out of the corner of the eye, have all these kind of emotional and effectual registers. And I think that, that kind of thinking out of the corner of the eye is, ties very neatly with a number of the things that have been developing over uh, from yesterday to today, about which I might, might not say more. Uh, I have been prompted, however, to think again about this relationship. Uh, specifically, I think uh, in the social sciences in the West, there's been a kind of affect turn. Some people have described an affect turn, which is a turn towards thinking about more about emotions and affect, mainly through some ideas drawn from Spinoza. I will not be doing that. <laughs> so what am I going to do? I am going to talk, I'm afraid, about the hangover. Uh, her, it's, a, it's an American movie, it came out last year. Who's seen it? Has anybody at all seen it? Okay, so that's like three people in the room. Four people in the room. Okay, good. Uh, Eleanor had to watch it because I made her watch it. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to come until she'd seen it. So. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but when you watch American comedies, I personally don't find them very funny. This movie, however, is actually funny. And, uh, and um, I, I think there is a tendency in urban theory to concentrate on stuff that's very serious, but also very scholarly and erudite and all those kind of things. Uh, but I actually like the fact that this is quite funny. So I wanted to deal with something that wasn't that important and was quite funny. And I think this ties with some of the things that Harvey was, uh, Harvey Mulch was doing yesterday, which is to actually think about the absurdity and humour uh, and the goings around of city life, the working around, how 
we work around stuff. So I'm going to use the hangover. It is not the most important movie of 2010. It is not the highest grossing. It's the 10th highest grossing movie of 2010. So it's not really that important a movie, but it's important to me. Uh, as you can see, uh, I, I think in the abstract you'll see that uh, I'm going to play on this, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So my central question really is, what, what is going on in Vegas? and what stays and what travels, what goes away. In other words, I guess, because I have a Freudian head on, I'm asking whether Vegas is a repressed or unrepressed space, whether it is the unconscious or not, how unconscious it might be, whether it is a site in which the unconscious is liberated, or whether this is a site of depression. So these are some basic Freudian questions about how we think about the liberation and expression of emotions and affect. Of course, the, so, uh, right, okay, before I go on, uh, let me just say that uh, the, in the movie, the three central characters are Alan, who is the brother of the bride, Stu, who is uh, a friend of the groom, and Phil, who is a friend of the groom. Basically, the plot involves a stag night. So they've gone to Vegas, four friends have gone to Vegas in order to have a last bachelor night out. Um, and what happens is they lose the group. They're going to lose him. So these three then have to try and figure out what happens to the group. In my version, of course, what's interesting is that they cannot remember what happened. So they are suddenly in a, in a situation where everything that happened on the night before is literally unconscious. Right, so the three men are the key figures. I would also like to point out the baby, uh, the tiger, which you can just about see on the left, and a chicken. Just bear those in mind. <laughs> Okay, so what happens in Vegas? What stays in Vegas? Um, for those of us who are geographers and went to Vegas to have a conference, we were lucky enough to stay in Vegas. What do you do in Vegas? Well, of course, we know what you do in Vegas. You get married, you go to a casino and you play on Elvis casino games. Uh, you go to nights out in which uh, you experience dreams. Uh, you go to bars where you drink too much. Uh, which is, uh, this one's about themed around the devil. Uh, there is obviously uh, girls of various kinds to be purchased or in, to entertain you in various ways. Uh, uh, there's the folie berger and there's magic. Uh, and uh, you, could, you won't be able to read this, but it says, um, uh, Anthony Cools, I'm not sure how cool he is, uh, it, he, he says you can... Uh, Lose your inhibitions, and it shows um, some uh, some visitors to Vegas with their underwear over their clothes, which is uh, not the way most people lose their inhibitions. So this is the kind of way in which uh, Vegas functions as a kind of imaginary space. It's a space in which uh, all kinds of inhibitions can be lost, and uh, but the important thing is is that when you leave Vegas, it's supposed to stay in Vegas. So, so Vegas then functions as a kind of unconscious space for America. It's where America can go, sin, leave, and leave the sins behind. Nothing like this happens in New York, of course. Um, right, so how does the story start? Well, it starts with the um, four boys on a rooftop overlooking uh, Vegas, and of course Vegas uh, is a very interesting space to look out over, <coughs> including an Eiffel Tower, of course. Uh, uh, they're in Caesar's Palace at this point, <coughs> and the groom is with them at this point, so they're starting the evening off all together. The important character in this particular scene is Alan. Alan is uh, the brother of the bride. He is not really one of the friends. So he's three, so Doug, Phil, and Stu, they're all friends. Alan is a stranger to the group. 
Alan uh, goes through a very funny narrative at this point where he describes how he, he thinks of himself as a wolf pack of one and that now he has been joined by these other three friends so they have now become a wolf pack together. What's happening in this scene? Well, uh, you can all make your own minds up about it. But the problem for, that I think Alan is trying to deal with is that he's not really part of the group. And that consciously, he's worried about how this group will function as a group that is now newly constituted. So what is this group going to be doing consciously in Vegas? What can it kind of get away with? Well, what's Alan's solution to the group and its consciousness to it behaving consciously is to drug it with roofies. So they're on the roof having roofies. Uh, uh, and uh, he's going to render them unconscious so that this can become an unconscious space, the kind of unconscious space that Vegas ought to be. And, uh, and, uh, and what the movie does at this point is kind of go through, well, it's actually fade to white, which is a relatively unusual move in dealing with black, with uh, unconsciousness. Mostly when people get knocked out in movies, it's fade to black, or instant black, but this fades to white. So we're we'll white it out. What the friends have to do when they wake up is reconstruct what happened the night before. Um, this is, this uh, map is actually from uh, one of the special features in the DVD. Uh, what it shows is uh, a kind of spatialization of the unconscious. So they're unconscious, uh, they're not aware of what happens, and it shows a kind of trail of destruction, a trail of absurdities and a trail of things that they go through. So the, uh, the boy, the boys who wake up and lose the groom, then their mission centrally is to find the group and get him to the marriage on time. Uh, where is he and uh, how are they going to find him? So, uh, they, so what they do is they look for clues upon their person, clues from what they're doing, uh, and look through each of these kind of clues to try and search out where it goes. Uh, a friend of mine described this as a kind of, um, like a psychoanalytic session. So in a psychoanalytic session, what uh, some people do is report dreams or report a set of clues, which the analyst will then interpret. The problem is that's not really what's going on here. Um, what's really, because it's the, them themselves that have to kind of figure out what the clues are to the city. What do they know about themselves that they can then use to kind of track down where and when they last saw the room and therefore track down where he is. So there are sets of sites that they're going to go through as they travel around Vegas. And Vegas is basically mapped out through these catastrophic and uh, bizarre and absurd. As you see, it doesn't quite add up, but that's kind of what one of the points we're going to come to. So they wake up in the hotel suite. And the hotel suite is in the Caesar's Palace. And it's filled with a set of bizarre kind of, these bizarre um, kind of collections of things. The, the, the filmmakers describe this as a collage of incredible parties. So actually what they did is they asked everybody they knew what, what kinds of things had happened in parties and how, her, um, and they basically added them all up and chucked them into this situation. You've got uh, cans of beer lined up, um, you've got Roman, uh, Roman gear, uh, bath full of stuff, there's, uh, there's the chicken, um, some woman leaving the room, and a tiger in the bathroom, which I'm sure is experienced none of us have had. So, they're set, so in other words, one of the ways of thinking about this would be to think about this as a dream moment. So instead of us, uh, in, to, to think of this as the, the dreams residue, Freud often talks about the ways in which the day's residue ends up in dreams, this is the exact reverse of that. This is where the dreams residue, the unconscious moments of the night before, suddenly appear in daily life. A set of bizarre things, bizarre objects, which is not interpretable in and of itself because there's no narrative there. It's just a collection and a jumble of odd things. So this is what they're confronted with. It's kind of the dream without any way of piecing the narrative together. So, uh, so the boys are going to be detectives of their own dream. Um, 
Now that's, uh, uh, and they've, what they're going to do is follow these clues from this dreamlike, these sets of dreamlike ideas. Um, what, of course, interests me, and because I've got my Freudian head on, is what they become is not detectives of the city, but detectives of themselves. That by going back through the city, back through uh, what it is they went through, they are discovering what happened in the city to them. So what the relationship is between themselves, the city, and their psychic reality. The city is then mapped through their psychic reality. The city, the city is now, uh, the psychic reality now is now privileged in relationship to the city itself. But there's obviously a way in which Vegas and who they are are being co-constituted or made in relationship to one another. So they're going to go back, as they go back through the city, they actually discover themselves through the city. So they become detectives of their own psychic reality. The privileging of psychic reality is, of course, a notion drawn from Freud. He's constantly trying to balance stuff out. It's imperfectly achieved. Uh, and uh, he is, importantly, also has one foot in the unconscious himself. He is the person who steals the tiger. He is the person who steals it from Mike Tyson, of all people. And, uh, uh, and one of the images I haven't shown you, of course, is uh, the bit where he simulates having sex with the tiger while Mike Tyson watches. Um, a scene which you can make your own mind up about. Uh, but we're not going to deal with that right now. Um, of course, the tiger and the, uh, the, these things play into Vegas. Uh, Vegas, of course, if you go to the MGM, uh, the MGM casino uh, place, you'll see the MGM uh, lions. So it's not as if the idea of wild animals, human and uh, other, uh, don't exist in Vegas. So you're tying together, so you're knotting together certain ideas here. But it's Phil, who shows the horror of these situations, who attempts to, pe forces the other two into developing clues and tracking down the clues. He's, for me, the ego. Importantly, with one foot in the unconscious. Alan. Right. Alan, uh, Alan of course, wasn't one of the friends. He's the guy who does the drugging, who creates the black, the white out of the situation. Uh, he moves, his, he moves in the movie, his character moves. Uh, when they wake up into the suite, they discover a baby. Um, so there's a baby in a cupboard, okay? <laughs> it's Alan who takes the baby and uh, puts it into the carrier and then wanders around with it. Uh, at this stage, I think, you know, one of the things that we can say about Alan is, is that he's being actually co-identified. He's the baby of the group. He's the one who, uh, who appears to have no ego, in fact. He's simply the baby. Later on, however, he's going to transmutate into a Rain Man figure. So, uh, so later on, so uh, one of the things that happens to the boys as they're attempting to find the group is that they, uh, they, get, they get interrupted in their, uh, as they grow through the they get interrupted by a gangster. Um, and like Ulf, wandering through Washington, they get waylaid. Uh, but unlike Ulf, uh, the, the mugger is naked, beats them up, and demands $80,000 for the return of the group. So now the boys have to make $80,000. And how are they going to make $80,000? Well, it turns out that uh, while Alan has no apparent skills and is apparently the you know, the brother people are going to drug people or just do stuff, uh, seemingly without anything to stop him doing stuff, he also has this facility for numbers and maths, <clears throat> and specifically gambling. So gambling is one of those kind of ways in which we think about uh, the city, that constantly people are kind of gambling in all kinds of ways. So Alan becomes, now becomes the gambler. He becomes, he has this kind of facility for maths, but also for a prediction and calculation. Um, and, and as a character, the gambler, of course, links back to or Benjamin and Zimmel. I, uh, whether Alan is a Zimmelian character, I leave up to you. Anyway, what he does is he wins $80,000. So he's successful. 
Now, if he's a cipher for anything, then, if, he's a, if, if this is about psychic reality, what kind of psychic reality is that? Well, for me, I think there are two things that Alan might teach us, or two ways in which we can think, Freud can think this. The first is, I think, um, the, the first is, for me, that one of the things that I think is less appreciated about Freud's work is a notion of the non-repressed unconscious. Freud's work is often uh, associated with the repressed unconscious. That's what you hear most about. A uh, kind of unconscious where all bad thoughts get chucked in a box, the box has the lid closed, close the key, throw away the key, and then all hell breaks loose. Um, lucky old us. Uh, in fact, I think Freud was also working with other kinds of notions of the unconscious. Alan can kind of represent that for us, and it's important to hold Alan in our heads. What Alan does is speak truth. He speaks what he's thinking. So there's no real sense of repression. He holds all kinds of ideas together. And, they can, and contradictory ideas can be held. He can be both bad father and bad mother all at the same time uh, as he looks after the baby. But he's not really looking after the baby because for him the baby is a kind of a toy. So he holds all these different ideas. In these scenes with the money, he holds the idea that calculativity and prediction of random events, that you can actually control random events, that you can control money, that you can actually win at a gambling table, that you can be a system that beats a system. So he's holding contradictions together. And I think with Alan, we have both these ideas, the non-repressed unconscious, and the expression of things that ought not to be said, as well as uh, a whole set of contradictory ideas that can simply be in place at any one point in time. So, that leads us on to Stu. Oh, welcome to Stu. Stu is a dentist. He's a very serious man. Uh, but not when he gets to Vegas, not when he has a few drugs in him, and not when he's very, very drunk. Well, Stu, uh, of course, uh, of course, because it's Vegas, they go to a strip club. My apologies, but they do. Um, uh, and uh, in this in this encounter, in this encounter, what intrigues me about it is less is less the um, the kind of obviousness of the strip club, but what what they exemplify here is the relationship between money and sex, and the relationship between love and money, and uh, the mistakenness of what goes on. So Stu is a classic figure of somebody who goes into a strip club and falls in love with a stripper. Right? And while he's doing it, he asserts his own masculinity by pulling out a tooth. Classically, Freud would call this castration. But this is not castration as an anxiety, it is castration as proof of masculinity. So he's, a, so he's suddenly doing all kinds of things. He's asserting his ability to deal with pain. He's uh, asserting his money. He's assert and he's mistaking love, sex, and uh, money, and the stripper in a kind of love relationship. And of course, where is all this going to lead? Uh, what we need to say at this point is that what Stu therefore represents is the id unleashed. And indeed, this is the way they actually think about the character. They're actually producing this. This is, this is unconscious, instinctual desires expressed. For me, another way to think about it is the mobility of investments. So what is happening, so this is a Freudian term. What this means is, is that certain kinds of things that you invest in, such as give significance to, emotional value to, then move about. Money, love, sex, these things simply become interchangeable and indistinguishable. And so indistinguishable that they eventually become, turn into something else. They get resolved in a particular way. And of course, the classic resolution of uh, the love, sex, money, uh, the failure to distinguish between the two or for investments to cross between these things is to get married, apparently. Uh, this, is a, this is actually one of those wedding chapels. Um, but, so, Stu and the stripper, who describes herself as an escort, they get married, of course, as you would. 
And uh, here we see, uh, and as you see at this point, Doug is still in the picture. He hasn't yet been lost, but they are all involved in this, this resolution. This marriage is simultaneously fake and real, therefore. It's a, it's a psychic reality, but not a social reality. It's a psychic reality because actually the id is unleashed. This is how it is expressing itself. It is playing through this investment in love, sex, and marriage, which is the American way. Um, and, uh, and at this point, there's no way, uh, there's no reason for that to kind of stop. However, the id unleashed is an uncomfortable place for anything to be. So eventually we are going to find that Stu is going to move from the person in the id position, representing these unleashed desires and anxieties and everything, and their resolution through a particular form, and he is going to be sat upon. So we see Stu change at the end of the movie uh, into somebody who is once more the dentist, once more, but this time an uncastrated. So he is going to dump his castrating girlfriend, the girlfriend who's very strong and tough, makes him to conform to all sorts of things. So it's an id that is finally brought into kind of some kind of social relation, away from the castrating girlfriend. So it, so the id, so we're going to see Stu move from this id situation into something else. This is important. If we're going to be thinking about the hangover as a set of unconscious or conscious agencies that are running through the city, it's important to remember that what stays in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas, it comes home. Uh, and when it comes home, it, come, it becomes something else. Um, this is Doug. What happens to Doug? I'm sure you've been asking. Uh, Doug, in fact, has been lost, uh, and this relates to uh, uh, Oxana and uh, Katarina's uh, paper yesterday, I think, the lost and found title was before, but I'm, I'm glad for the resonance. Uh, they, lose, they lose Doug. Uh, Doug is on the roof. Uh, he, uh, in order to prove that nothing untoward happens, we have, the, uh, we have his bed, his mattress, which he had been sleeping on on the roof, impaled on a Roman sword. Uh, thus proving that uh, nothing could possibly untoward have happened because we now have a a murdered mattress. Um, what happens is Stu is now uh, Stu is out of id mode and he is now in um, sublimation mode. He has now converted himself from being uh, somebody who is off with strippers into uh, the the doctor uh, into doctor dentist mode. He's going to save Doug. Uh, this is an important scene because what it does is re-establishes. Um, American uh, compulsory heteronormativity. Yes. Uh, and American heteronormativity means that nobody is not allowed to be in a normal couple in the end. Uh, this isn't, of course, usually true, but it's true of... Uh, uh, you can pretty much follow most American movies towards the moment where you have the wedding scene. This is how comedies end up. Uh, this one, of course... Um, I think there's a racial coding in this wedding scene, actually, but um, uh, which I may or may not talk about. I won't talk about. Um, but uh, what happens is marriage is the sacrosanct version of what happens. Doug gets home in time. Sorry if you haven't seen the movie, but he does. Uh, I'm sure you didn't expect that he wouldn't, uh, because he's found. He's, he, uh, where, where objects can be lost, it's also that people can be lost. Moral compasses can also be lost. But the important point about the movie and its happy resolution is that all moral compasses eventually end up back there where they are. All the people end up back in their social setting and the, and the marriage proves that everything, uh, everything ha uh, is back where it ought to be. And, um, and Tracy and Doug get happily married uh, while Tracy looks at uh, Doug's suntan. He's burnt to a crisp. So, so uh, in my in my crude rendering of this movie, uh, that means that Doug is the superego. 
so what we have, uh, what we can kind of say about Doug is that what he represents is the cultural codes and the reassertion of those cultural codes. The fake and real marriage of Stu in the marriage is now undone and redone, remade as a proper actual marriage outside of Vegas. How does Vegas then figure? Is it really that Vegas is the unconscious of America or that there's an unconscious life to cities? This is the question. Okay. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes just to sort of puzzle again about that question to come back to these themes that I've been developing. So what I've done is uh, use the characters as a way of thinking about uh, the uh, psychic realities or the unconscious realities of these characters as they go through the system. The ways in which Vegas itself facilitates and enables um, the representation of these characters as uh, as unconscious and conscious figures through superego, ego, id, and the non-repressed unconscious. If you look at Freud's uh, Freud's map, the Freud's diagram from 1923 of the mind, uh, what you don't find, I think, and it's important to really really important to realise this, is a nice layer cake of the mind. It is not id ego, superego in these nice little boxes, or unconscious, pre-conscious, conscious, nice boxes, nice layer cake, each layer separated in, in very straightforward ways. What you find is a blob, or a blob on a blob, or a lint over blob, with a little box and a strange canal in it. <laughs> this is more like, I think, what we might be trying to do here. It's about the relationship between, it's about the relationship in, between these things and the flow between the characters. It isn't that each one is actually the superego or the ego or whatever. It's about the relationship between each one as it moves in these positions. What, what Vegas is enabling is precisely the mobility of design, precisely through its spaces. It's producing the id in a particular way. It isn't that there are instincts as such, but the Instincts get produced in these moments. It gets produced in the strip club in a particular way. And there's a social and psychic reality being co-developed through Vegas. And it isn't that Vegas is exactly only Vegas. One can think of Moscow. I think I, when I came in from the airport, there's a great big sign saying Vegas, which means that Vegas is here. And, I, and you know, there's the hangover. Hangover 2 is in Bangkok. Is it really impossible to imagine the Hangover 3 would be in Moscow? That means that it, uh, as you think about the city, you can think about these sites and encounters and the movement and the ways in which affect and emotions are actually being co-constituted co through city spaces and enabled and facilitated. We can think about the play of repression and the play of the non-repressed the play of the superego and the ego in all sorts of situations. And we can respect the fact that the id will sometimes get out. So if we stick with a Freudian model, the classic Freudian model of the repressed unconscious, that isn't going to tell us too much about the city, I think. But where things can move around in the unconscious and it get expressed in different ways, then suddenly we have a city that can be mapped differently for its affects and emotions. Looking for those moments when these things leak out or get expressed, or when things black out. Now, it doesn't always require alcohol, but alcohol can help. <laughs> so, I talked about non-repressed unconscious, I talked about the mobility of things. I think, uh, I think it's very easy to think um, in layer cake ways about space and psychology and attempts to map fixed entities onto fixed entities. I've been trying to describe movement and the ways in which contradictions can and cannot, don't pay out. I mean, the absurdity of city life, I think, is absolutely crucial here. Uh, the way, I mean, uh, when Harvey was talking yesterday about these brilliantly absurd moments in security and fear, and you see exactly this, security and danger, anxiety, fear, playing through these situations, but without, almost without contradiction. The absurdity is in that lack of contradiction, in things that are absolutely opposed and seemingly in contradiction. I think what we therefore need to be conscious of is the dreamlike quality of city spaces. And I have given you a little bit of Moscow to give you a sense of that. 
dreamlike quality. What do I mean by that? What I mean here, or what I'm trying to draw us towards, is a sense that we can follow the clues, but these clues are not going to necessarily add up. That what we are left with is the residue of our dreams, as well as the day's residue in city spaces. All sorts of contradictory and bizarre elements are jumbled up, as Olga put it, uh, in creating city life. They're not going to add up. The chicken, I ask you to remember, think about the chicken, the chicken gets no story. The chicken comes from, goes to nowhere. There is a chicken. <laughs> the city remains unimagined, ungraspable, ultimately. And what we're looking for is ways in which we, we can put it back together in various ways. We can run narratives through it, but ultimately the city remains ungraspable. And I think that is perhaps its greatest advantage. And it's working. Um, because, so, from what I understood of your interpretation of um, of this movie, we can see that Vegas experience as one in which the city becomes a psychic space, which reorders consciousness, or which can be reordered by unconsciousness, like the drugs. Um, um, and in many ways, that Hangover reminds me of, of um, Benjamin's um, writings on hashish, wandering in the city. Um, but in many ways, I, I, my question really concerns thinking about other kinds of experiences um, in which we can sense this aspect of the city, this city as a psychic space. So I was thinking that in many ways this parallels my experience as a migrant in Moscow and other research, um, psychogeographical research on the way that migrants, new migrants experience places. Uh, for example, um, instead of I'm not on drugs here, I can't find any. <laughs> if anyone knows, <laughs> let me know. Um, so there's a, but instead of the drugs, I have a, I have a, um, a lack of language, of access to language, which is a huge part of my usual logic in navigating my home cities or cities that I know um, better. Um, and so the city instead becomes, for me, Moscow becomes um, identified by these moods. It moves, it turns immediately into a place of, uh, that's, governed for me by affects and emotions and constant nonverbal communicate or nonverbal interactions and even if it is verbal it's very confused all the time so it's <laughs> automatically reacting um, to to these places and then strange repetitions happen strange objects I have lots there are lots of things that appear to me like the chicken that I don't know what they're doing here in the city and why they're in my daily life but here they are and I try to figure it out um, <laughs> And all of these synchronicities, seeing people in one place and in another place and being confused. So anyway, I was thinking that this experience also travels for me back to New York. So when I go back to New York from Moscow, the, just as the, uh, the characters go back to their home lives, this aspects of this uh, kind of confusion uh, allow me to reorder spaces that I know really well, like Brooklyn, I get sort of confused sometimes. So I was thinking about if you can imagine other experiences um, like that might be like this, like a migrant experience or something, um, uh, or ways to kind of create these experiences. And my question has to do with thinking about what can these other experiences be. And also, if I'm a researcher trying to understand the city and put together these narratives, but what happens uh, to research if one is experiencing the city not as this narrative or this kind of logical place we put together, but is actually the research experience is happening 
in a psychic space. So can you translate what you said about their research to find this room into the kinds of things that we should do, what we could do in our research? What, what happens to research in that space? Um, if I caught it, caught it right, I think there are, two, there are lots of things in what you've just yeah, said. A lot. Uh, a lot of which are very interesting and I think we could talk for hours about. Uh, let me pick out two different things, I think. One is, I guess, psychogeography. Um, uh, I, I guess a lot of people in the room will know that there's a psychogeographical tradition as a way um, which uh, was deliberately a way of uh, attempting to map cities, um, uh, which is Guy Debord and experiments in Derive and all those kinds of things. Very classic sets of techniques. Um, uh, using maps of the wrong place to navigate the city in order to find out what the stop points are, where certain things happen. I think there are a whole set of experiments that have been conducted since in psychogeography, which are all fascinating. I mean, there's uh, this lost and found, I think. So, for me, I think that we're still, we're, um, in some ways, I think, psychogeography attended people to walking a lot. So then the figure of the flanner and walking all became very privileged within this, within this way of thinking about uh, how to experiment with understanding the city. And I think there's all kinds of things that we can now do that are very different from that. Um, I'm not suggesting we go out to get drunk and then try and experience the city through our inability to remember it necessarily. But I think that there, there ought to be different kinds of psychogeographical experiments that we can now conduct that we haven't been able to conduct here in you know, part to now. And I, and, and I don't really know how, I mean, you know, uh, for me, I guess, the point about mapping moods or attempting to gauge the mood of the city or to think about how effects is that and I, I never personally feel like I quite get it. Um, I mean, following vampires through cities was my way of attempting to do something slightly different as a way of capturing a certain kind of relationship between sex and death. Uh, it may be a bit peculiar and odd to have done that, but I guess it was just one way of trying to do that. And I think that we are at the point where we can try and think about imagining these things differently. I know people who've used uh, tarot cards as ways of kind of generating uh, different kinds of maps of the city to use, to use the tarot cards. Uh, it, it's always a shame when these things end up in car adverts, but I think there's now a car advert that uses tarot cards to advertise, advertise cards. So, you know, so there's all kinds of things, I think, uh, uh, that we can kind of think about, way, different, just different ways of kind of attempting to grow emotional and effectual moments. But it, equally, you can think about um, terrorism, bombs, you know, all those kind of other, other things that prompt intense and uh, intense effectual moments, I think. Um, so psychogeography, I think, once we get away from necessarily the figure of the walker, we can then start to think about all kinds of etiquettes and, and other things. All of which, of course, um, we have long, good, long and good traditions of thinking about. So I think, you know, maybe that can be pushed and tweaked in different ways. Um, uh, the second point is, do we push our psychic reality onto reality? And, of course, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we do. So uh, when we engage people, we found, you know, we engage them as fantasies and figures and projections of what they are like. Um, that's one version. The other version is, of course, is they're busy doing exactly the same to you. And, uh, and what interests me, um, I think, is, is that there are clearly ways in which we consciously and consciously communicate. Right? And uh, I'm interested in the, all those other ways. Now, I think that some of that can happen very quickly, very. Uh, uh, and affect and emotions can travel speedily through groups and, uh, and uh, between crowds and groups, between people. I mean, the, whether you instantly take a like or a dislike, so many of these are obvious examples of things. But uh, of course, I've been interested in uh, kind of other other kind of experiences. Now, I think I think there's a real question there about how affects travel, or emotions travel between people, and in what under what conditions they. Uh, and of what kind of psychic states people are more or less receptive to people. I wonder, being a geographer, how far affects travel. So how we can think about, I mean, quite a lot of the uh, conceptual work around affect is often uses the space of a room. Well, the space of a room is a very particular space, and we can think about this in 
ways in which we, we would think of the tone and the mood and the atmosphere of this room, which um, is hot. Uh, and, um, but what about a city or a neighborhood or a street or a motorway or a traffic jam? What's the affect of a Mos Moscow traffic jam? And I don't know how you kind of, how, how we are going to conceptualize that, let alone kind of in, interpret or think about it. Some of you may wish to sit in Moscow traffic jams and go and knock on other people's windows and say, excuse me, but what are you feeling right now? <laughs> our drive, but our drivers, our drivers unconsciously transmitting emotions across cars. Can an emotion, I mean, in Britain we had something called road rage, and we had a rash of road rage incidents. Suddenly we had an epidemic of road rage, which is now gone. I mean, and I, these, these, these emotional epidemics run through cultures and then kind of go and come. How do we interpret or explain those kind of things? How do we say of New York, well, I know London and New York are different. London has buzz, and London, uh, New York has buzz and London doesn't. How do we, how do we conceptualize that, let alone talk about it? More than just saying, London's buzzier. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but to be fair to every speaker, what I suggest is to ask three short questions and to receive three equally short answers. <laughs> <laughs> I can try. I, I have a very short question. Uh, the way you presented the film to us, yeah, uh, the frames, how did you arrange them? What is the arrangement? What, yeah, uh, did you follow uh, the did, order? Should I collect the questions and then answer? Or, or just, uh, how did I arrange them? Um, uh, they got, uh, um, I arranged them clockwise. Well, that I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Some were anti clockwise. In relation to the film itself? Um, yes, Tom. Uh, <laughs> I, started, okay, I started with a map and then I followed each character. That was it. And how, how does that, uh, how, would, uh, how uh, does your rearrangement relate to the actual chronology of the film? Um, right. One of the aspects of the unconscious I didn't talk about is timelessness. Uh, by by snipping out each character, I created a time for each character. Uh -huh. What I interfered with is the time of the movie, which is very different. Okay. Which okay. is much more like because a I was detective just story. What yeah, the, the movie is more. Like. Yeah, the, the, the movie is more like a detective story, okay. in which you discover, you know, the crime and the perpetrator, moving backwards in time. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Um, sir, uh, I had a question, uh, uh, just, well, I put a, uh, a short question, uh, it will be a shorter. The uh, question is, uh, why have you chosen the previous uh, uh, paradigm of uh, consciousness and unconsciousness? Uh, because I don't think that uh, uh, the realities, uh, the characters of the movie uh, appear in the uh, relative of consciousness and the relative of consciousness, you see. They are just uh, equal realities in uh, their ways of uh, constructing uh, each uh, having their uh, own logic and uh, each uh, has uh, its own uh, institutionalized rules and uh, rules that uh, emerge and uh, have uh, real consequences. Uh, and uh, they uh, uh, just uh, uh, not uh, 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 one unresist uh, by another, they are um, that's, that's an entirely fair comment. You're absolutely right. What, um, uh, one of the ways of thinking about theory is, is that it renders things more complex, right? That what we do is we use theories to say things are much more complex than we thought they were in the first place. Uh, I quite like theory to simplify. So what I've done is deliberately simplify. Uh, any more questions? Oh, yeah, well, just to this. I, as I haven't seen the film, well, I can ask only a theoretical question, not about the film. But, but what have you discovered? The boys, there, as I guess, have discovered themselves, but not the city. And what have you discovered in your presentation? Have you discovered the city? Or have you discovered 
the sacrality of that voice and that thing. Or have you discovered the sacrality of all of us here in Moscow? Or there is, or, or maybe have you discovered the link between the cyber reality as it has the link to the social reality, or to the realm of the basic person, something like that? Short answer is a little bit of each. <laughs> <laughs> but not enough of being any of them. Thank you so much.